Romans 11, and uh, I'll read verse, the first uh, 10 verses of the chapter for today, and we'll try to get through that together. Um, let me put it up on the screen for you here. Okay. Um, Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and bend their backs forever. Well, uh, Paul continues to address the situation of unbelief within Israel, and trying to give a rationale for that, a way of understanding what is taking place. The reason, in part, is because the rejection by Israel of the promise of the gospel may call into question the integrity and truthfulness of the gospel message. If those to whom it is addressed reject it, then maybe in the minds of some that would suggest that maybe this gospel really isn't consistent with the ancient traditions of Israel and perhaps is really a different kind of religion. So uh, Paul is engaged in an apologetic in defense of uh, the gospel that he's presenting, and in doing so, he has to explain why it is that there are many among the Jewish people of his day that are not receiving that gospel. Indeed, in the way that Paul begins this, uh, it seems like the situation is quite bleak. Uh, Paul asks, has God rejected his people? It seems like the uh, abandonment of the gospel on the part of the Jewish people was nearly universal. And so that, that's a, quite a remarkable setting for the preaching of the gospel, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. Uh, there is among the Jewish people such an apostasy from truth, an apostasy from the Word of God, that it seems as though God has entirely rejected His people. Uh, and so Paul wants to address that. Perhaps too, there is a sense that because there's a, this great wave of Gentiles coming in, that the, the new character of the church is really a Gentile church. And then you feed that into a kind of redemptive history uh, paradigm, such that um, it might seem in the minds of some that God had his purpose for Israel long ago, but that's over, and now his purpose is with the nations of the earth. And so there is to uh, borrow the language which is, which is a little bit popular today, there was a replacement. The, the Gentiles for the Jews. Jews no longer there, the Gentiles start uh, here. And it almost sounds like a dispensational arrangement where God has a plan for national Israel and then a second plan during a parenthesis age for the church, which uh, is a Gentile, uh, nearly entirely Gentile organization. So, has God rejected his people? Um, you'll note how Paul is 
continuing to develop his argument. His argument. He's taken us as hearers and those who would read his text uh, down through various logical steps along the way. And so uh, here in this chapter, he says, "I ask then." So he he's raising questions which prompt the people to think, and he's anticipating objections that some might have to what he's saying. So point by point, he's answering objections and explaining, clarifying the truth for us. Uh, so verse 1, I ask then, verse 7, what then? Okay, He's working from premises to conclusions. He's working uh, deductively, uh, analytically, if you will, to uh, explain the gospel and defend it from various misunderstandings. And I uh, call that to your mind again because in our modern age there is this uh, kind of sense that Christianity is something to be experienced and it's kind of feeling oriented and what counts is, if you will, the heart, which is the seat of the emotions. And if you feel the presence of God, even to use the old language of Schleiermacher, if you have this angst deep within, this feeling of uh, transcendence and reverence in your heart, you have this kind of a feeling for God, then you're having an experience of God, and that's not to be questioned. Um, Paul and, and we as well need to uh, understand God's revelation to us and work through the implications of that uh, from, from point to point, uh, answering objections and evaluating those objections and uh, putting forth the scriptures, the, the message of the scriptures. That's important for our own spiritual development. Uh, we're told uh, right here in the next chapter, in chapter 12, that we are to renew our minds. Uh, verse 2. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul, in many respects, has been giving us an example of this renewed mind that's testing different theories and points of view and proving that which is the will of God. So, uh, Christian faith is not merely an emotion-based, uh, feeling-based uh, experience but it's something that's grounded in God's revelation and calls us to think. And that means, too, that there is a place for careful distinctions uh, between truth and near truth at times. At times there are d there's direct opposition, and uh, we need to identify that and distinguish that. But sometimes the direct opposition presents itself as a near truth as something that's very close to what scriptures are saying, but uh, we need to think through what God has to say and uh, distinguish truth from, if you will, near truth uh, or outright lies. Um, I think of that in terms of what Paul says in the book of Galatians as he opens up his letter. He warns the Galatian churches about this uh, gospel, this false gospel, this alternative gospel they are, that they are accepting, which had a Judaizing element to it, which uh, is really the same sort of thing that Paul is arguing against here, where they were saying you must be circumcised and observe the, the ritual requirements of the law of Moses in order to be saved, in order to be a Christian. Yes, believe in Jesus, but he gets you so far and you have to complete that with your own observance of the moral law, or, excuse me, both moral and ceremonial aspects of the law. So, the, the danger of that is that, as Paul makes plain in Galatians, you're moving from a gospel that says that we are saved solely by Jesus Christ alone. His death, His sufferings, His righteousness are all that we need for our salvation from beginning to end. There's nothing more that we can add. That's the true gospel. A near gospel says, okay, you need Christ to take away your sin, perhaps your sin in Adam or to you know, everything up until this point. But after that, you need to engage in religious performances of one sort or another, suffering for the sake of, of um, God and righteousness or... Um, efforts to advance uh, God's kingdom in some way. But in any case, you're adding to the work of Christ something that you 
perform yeah. something that you accomplish and it's that element that man-centered element that Paul rejects and when you look at Galatians he says that those who promote this kind of a gospel this mixed gospel of partly Christ and the rest you those who promote this kind of gospel let them be anathema let them be accursed let God judge them and really it's consigning them to eternal punishment it's very very serious um, and uh, he, Paul is very concerned about the Galatian church he wonders who has bewitched you that you should you know, abandon the grace of God in Christ alone for this kind of works righteousness religion so um, the issues are very serious and we need to think through uh, what God has revealed in his word and sometimes make careful distinctions between things and for some people they don't like to have to think through things they just want an experience they want to be uplifted they want to have an inspiring story they want to be in, uh, motivated without actually thinking through what they're doing <laughs> You know, as Paul said earlier about the Jews, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that knowledge deficit is what's going to condemn them, because they have not known the gospel itself, truly. And Paul here, uh, I believe in this section we just read, will uh, mention, maybe it's not in this section, maybe it's in an earlier section, it mentions the ignorance of, of the Jewish people that they ignored. Uh, what God had to say. So um, I asked then, what then? Paul, reasoning things out. And, and so we're making, hopefully we're making clear distinctions, arguing back and forth, and setting forth the truth in its proper light, and resisting the influence of, uh, of a man-centered religion uh, to, to take, take over uh, the message of the gospel. So, back to his argument, has God rejected his people? That's the principal question that Paul raises here. And his response is a resounding no, by no means. Um, this is something that would be entirely uh, a shock to Paul uh, and, and unthinkable that God would, would reject his people. That is, reject them entirely. Uh, in toto, the whole thing. Has God completely rejected his people? And Paul's resounding response is by no means. And uh, he himself is the first example of that. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. He is the first test case. He is the example for the fact that God has not given up on his people, but he still has a purpose to save uh, some, at least, from among the Jewish people, Paul being a principal example of that. Um, sometimes I, I think of those who are skeptics and atheists and they attack Christianity and um, they, they come across as though uh, they are anti-Semitic or as though Christians are anti-Semitic. Uh, they might quote passages from the Gospel of John, uh, which speaks of uh, the Pharisees as being children of the devil and things like that and uh, denying that they are the children of Abraham and so they uh, make use of these kinds of things and say that the gospel and Christianity is essentially anti-Semitic and then you get some within the broad Christian community not making a judgment on their true faith or not but you get some who are in fact anti-Semitic and um, in total and for uh, inappropriate reasons um, but we, we need to remind ourselves if we ever have that a notion like that that the gospel has its origins among the Jewish people Jesus was a Jew all of the disciples were Jews um, the, the church began among the Jews it to the Jew first is the priority of the gospel message in Romans chapter 1 to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. So um, there's no place for a, a feeling of anti-Semitism, which is uh, a, a hatred for Jewish people, even because they 
uh, their ancestors were responsible for crucifying Christ or what have you. Um, Paul clearly has a love for his ancestral people. He has a love for the Jewish people and he is willing to die for them. That's not anti-Semitic by any means. That is a, a true love and concern for them and their well-being. And so uh, Paul reminds us that he himself is an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham. That was the, the calling card of the, the Jewish people, their attachment to Abraham, because with Abraham was the covenant. Abraham was the chosen one uh, set apart from all the nations of the earth. Uh, and so God had a unique calling to Abraham. And so uh, Abraham was the great father of the, the people of Israel. And then Paul identifies further his tribal membership. He was a part of the tribe of Benjamin, which is right next to Judah. And uh, the ben tribe of Benjamin would stay in the southern uh, kingdom, whereas the other tribes uh, uh, separated and went to the northern kingdom. So uh, the tribe of Benjamin was kind of the, uh, the, the right hand of the, the tribe of Judah. They were, uh, although I, I understand, if I remember correctly, many of the Benjamites were left-handed. I think that's a, something that comes up in the book of Judges. But anyway, um, they were uh, very much a warrior-type tribe. Um, but um, Paul identifies his ancestry, and uh, you can see him develop that further in Philippians chapter 3, where he talks about the fact that you know, in terms of religious attainments, he was a, a member of the a Pharisees um, and surpassed many of his uh, contemporaries in their religious traditions. So uh, Paul is very much a Jewish man, and he's not ashamed of it by any means. He's quick to identify that. Um, he's not self-identifying as a Gentile, uh, much as uh, uh, this white woman identified herself as a black woman and curled her hair and kind of darkened her skin a bit. Uh, Paul's not ashamed of who he is. He's a Jewish man. So <clears throat> he says, by, by no means um, God has not rejected the people whom he foreknew. And that's the great qualifying point here to what Paul has to say with regard to the rejection of God's people. There are many, obviously, who have not received the gospel, who have rejected Christ, who indeed uh, persecute the people of Christ. Paul, in fact, was among those that persecuted uh, Christ's uh, church. Uh, so uh, there are obviously many who are opposed to the message of the gospel among the Jewish people. But God has not abandoned his purposes to save some. Uh, and he reminds us of that word foreknowledge, those whom he foreknew. We came across that in chapter 8 of the letter where he spoke about uh, God's foreknowledge, which is not just knowing in advance that some people would believe and others would not believe and then granted them salvation, but rather it's the foreknowledge in the sense of loving them in advance, setting his love upon these people and setting them apart for salvation so that uh, their exercise of faith is rooted in God's choice of them, God's action in giving them faith and enabling them to believe. He could know them in advance because he has determined their salvation, that they would be his people. So, uh, he has not rejected the people whom he foreknew. Those whom he had not foreknown, yes, they are rejected. And we'll get into that here. But there are some that... Um, uh, are elect according to his grace. And so, in verse 2, he brings up uh, a historical example here that is relevant to their present situation. It provides an interpretation of their current circumstances. And he goes back to the story of Elijah, um, who, uh, you recall, had this great contest with the prophets of Baal at, at Mount Carmel. And all the prophets come in and uh, they challenge him. And he says, let the God who answers by fire be the true God. And so they, each 
present a sacrifice, the prophets of Baal set up their sacrifices and they are, are appealing to Baal for fire to come down and consume the sacrifice and nothing's happening and they're getting excited and they're starting to cut themselves trying to persuade Baal to act for them, you know, just doing whatever they can. <laughs> and Elijah's off to the side cracking jokes. <laughs> Cry a little louder. <laughs> Maybe your God is relieving himself. <laughs> Maybe he's off on a journey. <laughs> I'm sure he'll hear you. <laughs> he's using sarcasm to mock them and all that they're doing. <laughs> it only aggravates them all the more to cut themselves even further. You know, cry out to ba Baal. And finally, it's Elijah's turn, and uh, he, he not only prepares a sacrifice, but he douses it with water. So that there can be no question as to whether God has answered by fire. And then he looks up to heaven, prays to God, and sure enough, the fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice, consumes the water as well. And it, it's very clear that the Lord, he is God. So um, the people then take the, the priests of Baal and slaughter them uh, by the... the the, the side of the, the water there, and um, Elijah's excited. He feels like he's had a great triumph, and he's looking forward to a great day of salvation in Israel. And what happens? But he gets word from the king's wife, Jezebel, Ahab and Jezebel, and she says uh, uh, she will ha make sure that he's dead by the time the day is over. So Elijah runs for his life. And the context here is that this is where he meets with God down towards Mount Sinai and he makes his prayer to God. God says, "Why? what are you doing here? <laughs> You're supposed to be up there in Israel. Why are you down here? And he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. This is quite an indictment of Israel. Can you imagine? Uh, here, he has uh, seen some, at least, uh, put the priests of Baal to death, but the, the history of his people is that they are killing the prophets, of which uh, uh, Elijah is one. Uh, they've been murdering the prophets throughout Israel. Now, you put that in contemporary circumstances, that's kind of like, you know, a, a, uh, a political persecution uh, that an autocrat, a tyrant might have. You might think of um, uh, what occurred with Navalny and his imprisonment being put up into the Arctic and uh, 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 I view with skepticism the idea that he was just walking outside the prison for a little bit and then collapsed. Um, uh, I'm sure he, they were intending that he would not come back into that pr prison and they, they did something to him to uh, Expose him to the elements and he passed away there. In any case, um, here you have active persecution against the prophets of God where they're being executed within Israel. And this is the hostility of that day. And Paul is quoting this situation and applying it to his present circumstances and saying that essentially the same thing is happening today. You, you can almost hear Paul putting himself in Elijah's place when Elijah says, and I alone am left and they seek my life. Uh, he, he's not adopting that point of view, but you could see him sympathetic to Elijah uh, in, in terms of the persecutions that Paul has faced and the, the attempts made on his life by his own people. So, um, Paul brings us back to this and, and uh, it's an interesting use of scripture which is I think uh, helpful for us to examine this is a, a historical text from the Old Testament scripture and what Paul does is he takes this text and he has a little bit more to quote here and he derives a, a principle from that text which uh, he moves into the present age as the the things that happened in Elijah's time pointed to Christ and to his sufferings and death, which was the, the, the penultimate of the sufferings of these prophets, 
they put the Christ to death, and then the, the, the Jewish people were also attacking the apostles and the other believers. Uh, Stephen was executed, Paul even was there uh, when it, it took place. Um, and so uh, Paul is seeing this as a type of what he is experiencing in this present life, and he's interpreting it in, in that light, and finds that there's a, a principle at work in Elijah's time which carries on into his time as well, and that is this. Um, he, he speaks of God's reply. How does God answer Elijah? Well, it's going to be to the extent that, well, Elijah doesn't really understand everything that's going on. He has only a limited perspective, and he's uh, jumping to a conclusion here with regard to God's purposes and activity in the world. And so it's a reminder to us that God's work is much bigger than what we see. And we sometimes need to be patient, trust in God, and look for Him to do things behind the scenes that we're not aware of, but He's still very much at work. And so uh, God's reply to Elijah was, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 7,000 men. Elijah, <laughs> did you miss all these people? Um, you know, the... Uh, <coughs> the, the bowing of the knee to the, the Baals was similar to what Christians were suffering in the Roman Empire when they were required to bow the knee to Caesar to uh, give an offering or some incense to Caesar saying that Caesar is Lord. And so oh. you, you have uh, again a, a parallel to, to Paul's uh, present day uh, this bowing of the knee to a false god and yet, uh, in spite of the affliction that comes upon the Christian community in Paul's day from Roman persecution of this upstart uh, religion, this uh, insurrectionist religion, uh, Paul notes that God still has a remnant according to grace. I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So these men are those who men, women, and children, are, are those whom God has preserved from the evil one. He's kept them safe. And they've not bowed the knee to uh, the false god. And um, that reminds us that uh, we demonstrate our faith by refusing to capitulate to the emperor worship of our day. Where there is this demand that we follow Caesar as opposed to following Christ, uh, we need to demonstrate our faith in Christ and follow Him and not bow the knee to Caesar. So, Paul continues, and here's where he, he pulls it into the present moment. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. And this idea of the remnant is something that comes up in the uh, Old Covenant scriptures, particularly among the prophets, where th there's just a remnant of the people of God that are spared, are saved. Um, and so, uh, Paul says, you know, it, it, uh, among Israel there's a remnant. It's not the whole thing, it's not the majority of it. It's just a remnant, a portion. Uh, and, and these people are, are chosen by grace. Um, we're going to see that Paul uh, emphasizes the grace of God which leads to salvation is that kind of grace that is a saving grace and not uh, just a, a, a common grace that's extended to all mankind or uh, even a grace that was extended to Israel in terms of the many blessings that they had as among those whom God has externally nationally called uh, no Paul here, in speaking of this remnant, uh, is speaking of those who are the elect of God, who are chosen by God's grace, uh, His saving grace, uh, grace that uh, reveals their sin, but also points them to a Savior who atones for their sin and grants them a perfect righteousness. So, uh, the present moment, God is still at work saving a people for Himself. 
that should be an encouragement to us at times when we look at the general Christian community as compared to the rest of the country, the world, uh, and wonder, you know, is God still at work in our nation? And uh, you see quite a number of those who are pro professing Christians who really don't understand the gospel, who are preaching a man-centered type of religious uh, life and experience, and so that number shrinks even further. And you know, who are among God's elect? Is, does God still have a work to do within this world? Well, the, those whom he foreknew, that remnant, that he has chosen by grace, uh, these are the ones that are being saved. And so, uh, verse 6, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Um, Paul's emphasizing the univocal aspect of God's work. It, it is God himself who acts for us. He is the one who saves us. And our salvation is not works-oriented, not the result of works, because in that kind of works system, we merit salvation and that merit, that earning of God's favor, is not something that God gives to us graciously. It's something of a debt that he owes us. Just like when we go to work and we perform our jobs, we expect the employer to pay us according to our agreement. And so he is indebted to us. Uh, he, he needs to pay us. But this is not the way God works with us. If we live in a works righteousness religious system, uh, we will perish. Our works never are sufficient to accomplish anything in terms of putting away our sin or earning favor with God. Our best works fall far short of perfection. So, um, Paul emphasizes the gracious character of God's saving work. It's by grace and no longer on the basis of works, which is what the Judaizers were trying to, to do, to persuade the Romans and the Galatians and others that there were works that they had to perform. And this is destructive to the whole concept of grace, uh, and particularly to the grace that God shows to us in salvation. So, um, in verse 7, Paul advances his argument once again, uh, he says, what then? What shall we conclude from all that we've observed so far? Well, the answer is, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. That reminds us of what Paul said earlier about the, the Israelites uh, failing to obtain the righteousness that they were seeking. They failed to be able to uh, achieve works of righteousness that would please God. Uh, and so they failed at that. Um, but, Paul says, the elect obtained it, but the rest okay. were hardened. The, again, it's the small portion within the broader scope of Israel. There were some within national Israel, some who were the object of God's grace. They received righteousness from God, which the rest of the uh, Israelites did not, even though they pursued it zealously and did many different works and probably engaged in all kinds of personal sacrifices for what they were doing. They were all going in the wrong direction. They are going 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction, and so that didn't help them at all. There's the elect of God within that broader community who are the objects of God's grace, and they are saved by God's sovereign work on their behalf. So the one who works is not us, but God for us. It's his works that bring us salvation. Um, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Now, Paul uh, begins to talk about those who were left, if you will, left behind, those who were um, not the objects of this saving grace of God. Uh, he says that the rest of them were hardened in their rebellion, hardened in their sin. This is a judicial act of God against them for their unbelief. It takes us back to what happened with uh, Pharaoh back in Romans chapter 9 where uh, 
Pharaoh hardens his heart and then God hardens his heart as well such that he steadfastly refuses to let God's people go. Well, God is holding him up so that he might show his sovereign power and his grace in saving his people from uh, a relentless enemy. Um, so now, with regard to Israel, Paul says, they were hardened. Hardened in the rebellion as a judicial act of God. In verse 8, uh, we have a, a quote from a couple of places in, in the scriptures. The first one is from Isaiah 29, verse 10, where Isaiah speaks of how God, quote, gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. Note the origin of this. It comes from God himself. It's not just simply they themselves hardening their own hearts, but God in a judicial act hardens them further. We have some that don't like to think of God as uh, being a judge and uh, sentencing people for their sins. Indeed, hardening them in their rebellion such that they cannot be saved uh, because they don't want it and God gives them over to their sin. Uh, it's God who's the source of this. And he gives them a spirit of stupor, which is a spirit of uh, exhaustion, like you're, you're, you're very, very sleepy and, and can hardly be aroused. Or you're in a drunken stupor and you're just kind of wandering about. You don't know what's going on. Uh, this is what God has given to the rest. Spiritually speaking, they might be very intelligent, very alert. They might have... You know, a, a tremendous amount of knowledge of all kinds of different things. But spiritually speaking, in terms of their relationship to the true God and the way of salvation that He has provided, they are dull and senseless. They cannot respond to it. They're in a spirit of stupor. It's like they're drunk and they just have no conception of what's going on. They have eyes that would not see. They, they can read. They, they got eyes to see what's all around them, but they don't understand with the heart. They don't grasp what it is that God has for them. And so all the information is out there. They have the Torah. They have the prophets. They can read them. They can hear them read from synagogue to synagogue, uh, Sabbath to Sabbath. But they do not see and understand what God is saying. They have ears, that, but they do not hear. You note the physical and the spiritual uh, interacting with each other. And uh, here, the, the, the physical actions are, are not uh, resulting in the spiritual change that's necessary. Um, and then Paul uh, quotes from uh, David, uh, from the Psalms, Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23. Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Uh, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. This is what you would describe as an imprecatory psalm. Uh, it prays for God's judgments to be uh, brought to bear on the wicked. Uh, generally speaking, when that sort of prayer is engaged in, uh, the prayer is that God himself would judge his enemies, which are our enemies as well, but they are his enemies. And God is the one who determines how this judgment would be carried out if it's to be car carried out in this life. But here, uh, David says, let their table become a snare and a trap. That table is like their the dining room table. They're sitting down, they're enjoying good meals, everything's going well. Uh, they have great fellowship with the family and people all around them. Um, they, they live off of the bounty of the land and they're very self-satisfied. And with that self-satisfaction there's a trap and a snare. They think everything's all right. They think that God is pleased with them, that he's blessing them, and that they are in a right relationship with God. But they are misreading God's providence. They are misreading God's kindness and patience for the fact that everything's okay in their relationship to him. And it's not. God is withholding his judgments 
for a period of time, allowing them to have an opportunity to repent. And so they're, they're experiencing common grace. They're experiencing wealth and, and, and privilege and all kinds of good things of this world. But it's becoming a trap to them as it dulls their senses and persuades them to think that everything's right in their hearts with God. When the fact of the matter is that it's not. And so it becomes a trap for them and a snare. And if you know anything about a trap and a snare, when that trap snaps shut, the snare uh, catches its prey, that prey is caught and is not leaving. Um, so that's part of the judicial hardening which God is bringing to bear on people's lives. Even in, if you will, outwardly pleasant circumstances. Peaceful environment, prosperous, uh, good friends, good family, good food, all, all of that. It's a trap, and they don't see it. And um, I think elsewhere in, in Psalm, maybe it's Psalm 73, uh, David's looking on the prosperity of the wicked and wondering why it is that they're doing so well. And, and then he goes into the temple of God and sees that they are kind of on the glide path to destruction. Uh, everything's going very smoothly, but it's a broad way that leads to destruction, and they're on their way. And so it's a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. The stumbling block is that thing which you stumble so as to fall and uh, be crushed. Um, it's something that they can't get over. The fact that Jesus alone is the only hope of salvation for them. That they cannot accept. The fact that they, that all their righteousness is of no value before God. They have to chuck it all, forget it all, and cast themselves entirely on the mercies of God in Christ. That's beyond the pale for what they would think. And so um, it's a stumbling block for them. And a retribution. It's positively God's judgment on them. Um, I was watching... The interview last night of Donald Trump by Laura Ingram on Fox News. I don't know if any of you got to see that or not, but um, there was a, a woman, middle-aged woman, who comes up to the microphone and asks President Trump if he's going to um, use his position in office if he regains the presidency to uh, seek revenge on his political enemies. And um, Trump said, in effect, well. Um, my revenge will be in success and uh, the success of the American people and they're doing well and I thought that was a very good and a positive answer to that question that he's not going to do what the Democrats have been doing against him by attacking him with uh, lawfare and trying to uh, uh, really impoverish him and keep him from running um, he's not going to respond to them in that way. He's going to be too busy working for the American people to be involved in that sort of thing. That's good. Yeah. But God is the one who judges, first of all. And he will judge our enemies and bring their wickedness to account. And so whenever we face that kind of thing, we need to, first of all, commit that to the Lord and uh, live our lives in such a way that as we do good to our fellow man, uh, that will, as Paul says later in this very letter, that will heap uh, coals of fire upon their heads uh, as we um, do good to them. So how do we respond to our enemies? Well, it's by blessing those that curse you and uh, uh, doing good to those who um, afflict you. So overcome evil with good that's uh, something to, to be learned here but uh, Paul knows that God is the one who will seek retribution and punishes the wicked for their sins they don't get off scot-free um, they will suffer accordingly um, and then let their eyes be darkened. This is David's prayer. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Uh, so he doesn't want them to figure things out. <laughs> Give them over to their wickedness and sin. Let them be blind to the message of the gospel. Harden them where they're at. 
and bend their backs forever. That might be sell them into slavery where they are uh, overwhelmed with a load that they need to uh, work at. Um, John Murray suggests uh, that they um, are, are bending their backs in, in grief uh, over um, the retribution that they're facing. Uh, one way or the other, uh, we see here that God is the one who will judge the wicked. And so it's a warning to those who are outside the kingdom or who take their faith in God just superficially, it's a warning that uh, God will judge those who are still trusting in their own good works, who think as long as their good works outweigh their bad, that God will accept them to heaven. And as long as they haven't done something too terribly bad, uh, you know, murdered somebody or what have you, uh, then they'll be okay. No. Uh, God requires perfection, both from within and without, from the heart, the th thoughts, desires, choices, whatever, and everything that we do, God requires absolute perfection. And any deviation from perfection will face God's sanction, which is death. The soul that sins shall die. Uh, so a very, very serious situation for the uh, those who are outside the, the, the kingdom of God but have certain influences upon them. They need to seriously think about the relationship with God, uh, lest God's judgments come on them and they are hardened in their sin. Okay, that's a tough spot to end. <laughs> um, very sobering uh, portion there. Um, but uh, next time, God willing, we'll have some uh, encouraging things to consider in God's salvation of the Gentile peoples. So I'll pause here and see if you have any questions or comments. <coughs> well, thanks for another good study, Pastor. It's great. It's, it, it seems like that, that stupor that was being applied to the Jews is is uh, pretty universal. It's not it's not just uh, True. just these days. It's like it's, 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 there's a lot of stupering going on. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, so. That's true. You know, it's, it's evil is good and good is evil, and it's, ma it's amazing how. It, it makes sense when you see that it's that it comes from God, God giving them over to depravity. Right. It's it's pretty widespread. Yes, it is. Um, it, it makes you think of what Paul says in I think it's Second Thessalonians two, where he talks about how um, God removes the that which is restraining and gives people over so that they believe a lie and uh, people today very much believe lies and they're being fed lies and they're liars and they themselves are deceived by their own lies. Um, it's just a very sad situation in our world. Um, so when he's, um, when he's specifically applying it to the Jewish race, then it seems like the religion Judaism becomes a way to codify stupor. Mm. That was we're going to have a religion that right. officially rejects and codifies the error that we believe. That's true. And and that's that's uh, that has persisted through the centuries. It not only codifies that, those religious beliefs but also sanctions the people such mm -hmm. that uh, it, it makes it very difficult for you to leave that kind of group um, you know, kind mm -hmm. of, I, again listening to Donald Trump last night talking about Nikki Haley and why is she still staying in the race and Trump said had an interesting answer he said I don't think she knows how to get out of the race and she mm -hmm. has um, all these 
uh, political people in her ear telling her to stay in the race and then she also has the donors supporting her for this and she doesn't have a clear way to get out of this. It's kind of like a trap that she's in here where mm -hmm. you, you, her, all of her political associates are urging her to stay on because she can beat Trump in the end. Uh, Trump's going to fall because of the indictments that are being brought against him, what have you. Uh, and she'll be there to pick up the pieces. Um, Financing's there. You know, a lot of times a political campaign collapses because it runs out of cash. But she's got plenty of cash to work with, and so she's going to hang in there. And it, it, it's, it's kind of like what happens in a religious system. You have a system of beliefs which may be leading you to destruction, like an, an election today in South Carolina that could <laughs> ruin your political career if you get beaten badly. But uh, there are uh, things which enforce the behavior and make it you know, trap you in, in that system. And so within Judaism, if you abandon Judaism, you, you might be mourned as, you know, cast out of the family, treated as someone who's died, you know, uh, ostracized from uh, business relationships and all this sort of thing. Uh, so there are different kinds of sanctions that come on you if you consider leaving the group. And so it's a very serious thing. Uh, Romanism is much the same way. That, you know, no salvation outside the Roman church. Uh, anathemas on those who believe that we're saved by grace through faith alone, <laughs> without human works. Um, you can go back to the 17th century in the Council of Trent where they announced all kinds of anathemas, really on the Protestant faith, uh, or on Christian faith. Um, and to my knowledge, that has not been retracted. Um, so, you know, there's a system in place that codifies the religion, organizes it, gives a sophistication to it, but then also sanctions anyone who would try to get out of the system. It makes it very, very difficult to leave. You can not leave, but it might be a great cost, as it was for Paul when he left. Um, yeah. It seems that. Uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I, I was just going to say. I think. I think it's important that we as Christians remember that just as we're amazed and thankful and grateful that when we look at all the resistance to God in the world and, and we see God saving us, why is it that we're saved? <laughs> you know, that that we can also look at those who are Jewish believers and rejoice and say and give glory to God. That isn't that amazing. Despite all this, God has chosen some, right. and and yeah. we, that's something we can rejoice in. Absolutely, um, yeah. And because, boy, I'll tell you, we could just if we just focus on what's going on, how many people aren't saved, it could be pretty depressing. So, <laughs> if, yeah. I mean, it's true and everything, but but it's um, be thankful in all things, and you know, in everything, give thanks rather. So. Um, I think it's good to remember that that God is still at work, and He's He's called us. Thank you, Lord. And He's calling some still in the Jewish faith. Yeah, it's, it's so out of out of Jewish faith. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's a great reason for joy when you see a Jewish person come to faith in Christ. It's just an amazing thing. And, mm. um, I think a Jewish person adds a unique perspective to faith in Christ. And it's just a, they have a new, unique perspective and perhaps certain insights into faith in Christ that I think are unique to them. And so they certainly enrich the church rather than yeah. Yeah. problems. Yeah, I think I... Uh... I think I shared this before, but years ago when I asked my Jewish believer daughter-in-law about what changed, you know, what was what was it like coming into the Christian faith, and and uh, now that you know there's a completion and all, she she made the point that you know it, it's it's just a um, it's just a natural extension. And like nothing changed. It was I, I didn't become something different. It was who 
it was a completion. It was a fulfillment. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's not it's not that exchange one thing for the other. It was blessed to be completed. Yeah. For, yeah. That's a great way to look at it. That's exactly right, too. Um, yeah. It, it seems that all they need to do really is just read the New Testament. Mm. You know, if they could just read it and, and seriously read it and study it and take it seriously with open mind for a little bit, I don't see how they can't really accept it. There's so much connection yeah. to the Old Testament, and it, just, it is a continuation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a shame. Yeah. It, 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 sometimes it's frustrating when you see, especially smart Jewish people, they're like, you guys are scholars and you can't put this together. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like yeah. the most simplest thing. Yeah. But I was going to say, like with the with the with the with the, the, the case with the politicians and the and the they're kind of like the bells, you know, they're they're obsessed with false idols. Of they they get like like the way that um, Nikki Haley would get got sucked into this with these these false idols of you know of uh, prestige and power and money and all this influence and and the, these people take have control over her. I, I can see how they could get stuck in that. If they, you know, they're representing the people's far distant memory. You know, I don't even know if they can actually get back to representing the regular folks that they're the taxpayers that they represent. But when they get that far out, I just look at like the old politicians and still in office, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. They're just in there too long. They have too much time to to get for the world to get its hooks in them, and they 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 turn away from from God God and God we trust and they and they turn to all these worldly false idols and they and they're stuck. And they're like, yeah. It's 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 a shame because people really, really suffer. You know, new Christian families suffer a lot from that. It's uh yeah. the Christians thrown to the lions all the time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, when you look at the composition of the New Testament, what's the first book in our Bibles but the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew was not the earliest Gospel written. Mark, most everyone agrees, was the earliest Gospel written. Uh, but Matthew is the first one in. And why is that? Well, it's, if you will, the most Jewish of the Gospel accounts in that it's constantly quoting Scripture and showing how Jesus fulfilled Scripture. So it naturally pulls together the Old Testament into the New Testament. And for Jewish people, you know, it's like what Paul says, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Um, the Gospel of Matthew shows Jewish people right from the very start, this is the one who's come to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, it, it, it goes through the, the life of Jesus and, and shows this fulfilled this, this fulfilled that. And it goes all the way through that. And so a Jewish person, if they would just get into the Gospel of Matthew and read through that, they'd have to come face to face with the fact that the Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled in Jesus. And it's hard to escape that. Logically, you can't escape it. It's there. So now what do you do? It's a point of will you submit then to God's plan for you or will you rebel? We submit and perhaps look further and re read through the rest of the Gospels and read through the epistles of Paul and so forth and get a full view of it? Or, you know, what, what are you going to do with that? I think it's amazing how God in His providence arranged the Gospel for that purpose. Um, it's like they're stuck in Jewish orthodoxy. They can't take that next step up to Christian orthodoxy. It's like yeah, yeah. They, 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 they can't, they, they, a lot of them, I, I would Read. They, they would say Jesus was the, a, a great warrior. He fought that he fought the Romans and this and that. But they can't, they can't see the prophecy fulfilled. Right. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> but they, it's like that. I, I guess maybe, maybe that they they figure they're Orthodox Jews, you know, and they can't leave that. They're tied in there, and they, they can't do anything else but Judaism. I, I don't I don't know, but I mean I can't make any sense because some of them seem pretty bright. Yeah, yeah. There, I think there's a lot of attitude that says, you know, we've been persecuted enough. We have to retain our identity. We, we. If somebody starts talking to you about Jesus, run away. We, we have to preserve who we are. 
and but it, that's not it, that's cultural if, if you look deeper if you look deeper it's what it comes down to is what it's always been we don't want this man to rule over us and it, it takes the holy spirit to crack through um break it open but that comes from reading from the word of god like Chuck was saying, read the, read the New Testament and see it, and then pray that the Holy Spirit will do the work. Uh, but but so much is cultural. It's it's amazing. It's a protect protection. You know. That's a that's a great point though. If they weren't regenerated, they they might not see. They may not. It's how how could they? I used to uh, witness down at Temple University when I was first out of seminary. I uh, went down to the Student Life Center and we would do surveys among the students at Temple University. And one Jewish girl in her 20s uh, really became interested in Christian Christianity and so forth that I can remember her. I think her name was Marjorie. And she sat in the student life center one day and she says, I know that everything you've been teaching me, and she was, wasn't was just thinking of me, but at Glenn, um, Glenn uh, who was uh, the director of the student life center, she was thinking about him too. And, and she said, I can see, I even see predestination, she said, and, and and a lot of these doctrines as being true. But she said, if I say to my parents, I'm a Christian, I'm dead in their eyes. And so, so the hardest thing for her was the rejection of her parents, of her family, and all. So that's what we began to pray that, you know, that she would make that step. I don't know if she ever did. Uh, Pastor Rich, um, when I think about how Christians are and their prayers and repentance, uh, we're really the guardians for God's anger. You know, I don't know the speed of ministry or how it spreads or anything, but I'm wondering, remember Chuck was talking about how we hoofed it and then there was horses and then there was telegrams. I wonder if his mercy has given gave us the internet to speed up ministry. Yeah, obviously I think it has given us opportunity to reach a lot of people in a way that uh, we would not be able to reach otherwise. I mean, if we were just if we didn't have this way of communicating, then it would just be those of us who are local here meeting together and talking. So uh, that would be a, a much smaller group. And when I post videos of our services online, there are a lot of people that um, see and observe the, the videos too. Um, I was pointing out to uh, a couple of guys last Sunday that uh, we had over a hundred people take a look at our video last Sunday for the worship service. I'll show you the report here. That's the report that uh, YouTube gives me um, when I finish my video. And you can see on the upper, I guess that's the left corner there for you, 106 people at that time. You can see the total hours of listening time of seven hours, I think, if I'm looking at it correctly. Um, so, uh, total number of people watching at the same time was 11. So you get people hop in and out and that sort of thing. But you know, just to Justin's point, this medium provides us an opportunity to reach others, much like the printing press of long ago and uh, television and these kinds of things. So it's just another way to uh, advance the gospel. Um, and reach people who are at a great distance from us or with whom we'd never have any contact. I would never know Roman Tarenko apart from the internet or James Kasambi or any of the others there in Africa. Um, they would have been 
complete strangers would have never known of their existence were it not for this. So, um, as those who share the gospel with others, we have to declare the whole counsel of God to folks. And uh, you were talking about being the custodians of God's said anger or wrath. I'm not sure. Um, we are responsible to warn people of the judgment to come and point them then to the gospel of God's grace as the solution. And um, you really don't understand the solution until you see the need. Um, if you just present good news, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for you, okay, good, fine. <laughs> I'll just keep going. But if you say, you're a sinner under the wrath of God, you are liable to eternal judgment, but you, if you repent and call on the name of the Lord, uh, you will be saved. Uh, believe in what He has done for us in Christ. He punished Christ in our place. Christ rose from the dead. And confess Him and follow Him, and you will be saved and spared from the wrath to come. And so I think Chuck and Tamara are talking about going to see the ark of Noah, a replica of that down in Kansas. Is it Kansas or Kentucky? Um, maybe Kentucky. Um, in any case, in Kentucky. 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 Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, think of the times of Noah. People were not believing him when he said, rain's coming and there's going to be a, a disastrous flood. And people are thinking, you're nuts building this ark in the middle of nowhere. There's no lake here. There's no river. What are you doing? But he continued to build in the confidence that what God said was true, that wrath was coming, and except they repent, they will perish. Well, they didn't. They thought everything will continue just as it is, uh, and it didn't. Uh, the uniformity of natural causes is a great uh, mistake. Uh, to think that everything always happens, the way, it happens now the way it always has, or what have you. Um, things change, and God intervenes in history and time. The great intervention will be when Christ returns from heaven and gathers his elect and brings in a new heavens and a new earth. So.